so I, um, in my work, I get to go out a lot and be on the trails, but not as much as you might think <laughs> or that I wish I could. So I did borrow a lot of photographs from other people who have been out and about and try to credit them appropriately, of course. But um, a lot of these images I did not take. And uh, so I'm gonna share now my presentation with you so we can talk about the pictures as we go. Um, let's see. And there we are. All right. So I am going to talk mostly about uh, mammals and mammals of Maine, but you can take a whole nother class with people uh, even much more knowledgeable than myself, certainly about invertebrate tracks and signs. We, I'm going to focus on snow as the substrate because that's what people are seeing right now. Uh, but every substrate's different. And so if you're looking in sand, or you're looking in mud, or you're looking in um, snow, it's all, it's all different and it behaves differently depending on the track. So these are little tracks and signs left by marine invertebrates, marine um, polychaetes, probably some kind of clam worm or um, related, related worm that this is actually down at, at Dodge Point. So just moving rocks and looking at the low tide areas and seeing what kinds of animals are there. But most of what we're gonna talk about today is, is the mammals that we're seeing out and about in the snow in Maine right now. So you too can go online and find tracks and signs, um, charts like these and books. There's some tremendous resources out there. They are, um, you can find ones very specific to this area. You can find ones like the one here where it shows not only the track and the size, but also something about the patterning um, of the tracks, which is extremely important and helpful when you can't see the distinct paw print or toe print or toenail print. So I, when you're looking for a good one, uh, look for ones that show not only the size and not only the shape of the footprint itself, but also the patterning so that you know something about whether or not this is going to be a bounding or, or a inline or um, what kind of pattern you might, it will help you narrow down what you're looking at when you go out in the field. And many books do a great job of this and many books do not do a great job of this. So be discerning, I would say in your in your finding of a field guide, looking for track guides that will show you the patterns and the um, variability because animals are individuals. And so they behave differently and they do different things and they even walk differently or trot differently. Um, of course, there's, there's similarities, but there can be vast differences as well. Um, we will talk some about animal signs like scat and um, dens and, so forth, but uh, honestly, my images of these were somewhat limited and we had limited time. So I won't get too much into this, but again, um, it might surprise people to know that there are indeed scat um, diagrams and charts and resources. Uh, so that is another great way to identify um, what the animals are and something about their behavior, because certainly it can, you know, where the animal's leaving its scat and how it's doing that is actually um, related to the behavior. And so it can be um, an interesting element, not only of identification, but understanding more about the wildlife, which I think ultimately is a big part of why people enjoy doing this is, is learning about the animals and what they're doing and why they're doing it. So uh, one thing I just want to mention about scat versus owl pellets. Um, in general, most scat is going to be tapered at the ends, and that's because of the peristaltic action in the lower intestines where the animals are actually excreting moisture and nutrients. Um, and it's not all the time going to be like that, but if you're looking at a, um, at a owl pellet, which is what owls cough up um, when they can't digest the hair and the and the uh, bones from their from their prey. Um, those are usually going to have blunter ends, and they're not going to be tapered or twisted at the ends. And of course, they're also going to be in a place where an owl is either 
gone or flown or more likely perched. And so that's a, a place you could look for, for owl pellets, um, which are, if you haven't dissected an owl pellet, I highly recommend it. It's super interesting. Um, and uh, you can, you if you find an owl pellet, it's, it's a really fun thing to, you can learn quite a lot about what they're eating by just taking them apart and looking at the bones. So uh, do feel free to, um, you know, if you have questions or comments, just let me know. We did have a question about um, what your favorite guide for Maine was. Do you have one uh, that stands out to you? Um, I, you know, I do, but I can't remember the, t the author's name at this exact moment. So let, let me think about it for a second. I'll come back to that. I'll also at the end of this presentation show you a couple of the guides that I recommend. They're not necessarily my favorite, but they all lend something useful. So yeah, Angela, I can't actually see the chat right now very well uh, with my the way I'm sharing these slides full screen. So thank you for doing that. So uh, a lot of folks have asked, like, how do I start looking at tracks and, you know, begin to have a sense of what I'm looking at. And one place to start is, um, you know, just if, if people are drawn to the tracks, it's the tracks themselves. And so a lot of times when you look down into the hole or at the, at the print, you're going to start to see, okay, how many toes, um, one toes, a horse, two toes, deer and moose. Uh, three toes. We don't have any three toed animals, honestly, around here that I know about. Um, but four toes, the front foot of many rodents, snowshoe hare, both back and front, um, cat like animals, dog like animals, birds, if you include the halix, which is that little toe that sticks off the back side of their foot. So um, that's, I think, spelled wrong. My apologies, halix. At any rate, um, and then five toes, you know, those are the beavers, humans, um, and the weasels. And sometimes in the weasel tracks, you can actually frequently, you cannot see all five toes. You only see four toes. They're either obliterated by the hair around the toes themselves, uh, like in the case of a, um, a marten, a pine marten, which has very furry feet. Um, and then you're also, you know, sometimes the animal's toes don't hit the ground or substrate very well, you know, very evenly. And so in some, in many cases, you're not going to see all five toes, but they do have five toes. And then the back feet of many rodents like squirrels and mice and things like that. So that's just sort of a general way to kind of start. If you do have a good print um, that's fairly clear, you can start to be able to identify a little bit about what kind of group of animals you might be looking at. Um, and then really the primary way that I go about looking at the tracks is, you know, it's always that first, that first view of them, you know, what does the overall site look like? What behave, be excuse me, what behaviors am I seeing? And what is the pattern of the track? Um, and so this was actually forwarded me by Kathy and she, um, well, she forwarded these to me for the fireside chat program, actually, and I wanted to use it for this as well. So she saw this and um, didn't know what it was. And there was animals that had been clearly excavating or an, an, a animal that had excavated around under the trees. And these are oaks that it's around. Um, and there's those prints, but even the close up print, the image there is hard to discern like what is this? And so at first she said something in her email to me about coyotes. And, you know, so we kind of toyed like, well, is it a coyote with a cache, you know, a store of food? Because um, coyotes and also uh, fishers, for example, will take their food and store it for later sometimes, um, hiding it usually in a more, um, like this is almost in an open area. But so those animals would generally cache their food sort of, you know, pile of brush or somewhere um, that's a little bit secluded. So, um, you know, I, I kind of was, went down that road for a little bit. And obviously this is, if you look at the, the tracks themselves, this is an animal with fairly long legs, um, fairly big, you know, without even, it went through the snow, um, the snowpack, even if it was soft snow, it's gone all the way down. 
Um, and so then we were thinking, well, this is this is under the oaks. And even without getting a good view of the prints, uh, at this point, I'm leaning towards this is a deer track. And I never have seen, a, and I don't think Kathy was able to get a clear photograph of the prints themselves. But um, just from the behavior. So this is deer, and they're scratching underneath the pawing underneath the trees looking for acorns. Um, and so the trees gave me a hint the uh the size of the animal um and so forth so that's where i'm leaning right now with this one even though i haven't seen a clear image of the of the track itself um so is kathy with us today is she on here let me see here curious at any rate um she she can chime in if there was anything more that she's seen or saw about this at some point. Um, so this image was uh, shared with me by Kit Pfeiffer somewhere along the sheep scot. And this is another example where you, you really don't have to see the print itself. You can see kind of the pattern. There's a mess by the water of activity. And then there's a long drag mark. Um, and that these are otters, um, or a, at least a otter, maybe more than one. And the otter has come out of the water and messed around on the snowbank and then slid back down into the water. And this happened some time ago based on the fact that there's not a distinct set of lines or tracks by the snow, even though we're across the water here, this is pretty indistinct. Um, and so presumably the water was open at that time, at that moment. Um, right at right when that animal was was on the bank and and otters you know their tracks will go to and from the water generally so they're um, they're not going to go up a tree for example so even without seeing the clear defined five toes and the big webbed feet they do have big webbed feet on the back and they do have um, you know a not as big as a beaver, for example. They're, the beaver back foot is going to be much larger and more triangular shaped, but they do have some webbing on their feet. And their feet are fairly large for a, for a, a weasel around here. Um, but all this other act kind of behavioral activity that you're going to see with an otter. Um, even, otters will even bound through, you know, like a field. If they're going through a field, they'll bound and slide. If there's any possibility to slide on their bellies, uh, even if they're not near the water, they'll bound, you know, take several big jumps and then slide for 20 feet, even on, on icy, slippery, hard packed snow, and then they'll resume the bounding. Um, and so if you don't see footprints or many footprints in the sliding mark, you can guess that it is um, very likely an, an otter, even if it's not right on the water. So here is another pattern. Well, you might say, okay, this looks a little bit like the otter situation. Like we've got like these, these belly marks of some sort. Um, and this, these images are not super distinct, which I apologize for. But if you can see in the, the upper um, one where you've got some little bits of um, greenery laying in the snow as well, not only is there a belly mark, uh, but there's some footprints right in that belly mark. And in fact, you can see that a little bit but less distinctly in the image below where you've got the belly mark and then you've got quite a few tracks all the way the duration. So this animal is not sliding on its belly. This animal is dragging its fat belly through the snow and making footprints as it goes along. Um, and even without seeing distinct footprints or toe prints or toenails. This animal does have long toenails. This is a porcupine. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of times, I, I've gotten lots of questions about porcupines over the years because they do leave this very strange looking track. It looks like a big trough. And when, when the snow is deep, it's almost ridiculous looking because you could think about that poor porcupine plowing through the snow that's over its back, uh, making this trough on its short little legs and um, just kind of, probably just aiming generally for the woods and then finding a tree that it wants to go up. The, uh, the little bit of leaf or um, pine needle, you know, spruce tips or whatever those are that are on that upper image um, 
are also telltale. It's common for porcupines to bite off the buds and they drop bits and pieces as they're doing that. So you may find lots of uh, squirrels will do this too, but you may find bits and pieces on the ground that the, that the animals have been working on eating uh, in the trees above. So, um, so Charlie is a, actually a great uh, tracker in Southern Maine. And I, I included his picture here because he has demonstrated a couple of things in these three images. First of all, uh, this is another example where you can look at the, at the patterning of the tracks and get quite a bit of information. And the other thing I like about this series of images that he, he actually included this on a Facebook post specifically as an instructive um, set of photographs because it shows you if you if you want to identify animal tracks, one of the um, ways that will really help you to do this is to take uh, measurements. So whether you use a ruler or something else for a sense of relative size, uh, when you take the pictures, I encourage you to you know throw a hat or a glove in there at least, um, and you'll see that through some of the other photographs we have. But a ruler is a great thing, you know, the easy light thing to stick in your pack is a small, a small um, tape measure and then you can lay it next to the tracks. It, there's another set of photographs that we'll look at it later in the class that um, you'll see there's another, you know, you, sometimes it's helpful to lay the ruler from track set to track set and sometimes it's helpful to lay the ruler uh, crossways, um, sort of horizontally uh, instead of vertically in the image. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So these um, these are, what Charlie shows with these three images is really nice because you've got the tracks of, the, it actually is the same species of animal. These are all the same animal. Well, I don't know if they're the same animal, although it's very highly likely that they are because this animal goes back to its, um, they make a, a route that they cover every either every 24 hours or every 48 hours or so, and that's how they hunt. Um, and I'm not I'm not telling you what it is right away because I kind of want you to get a chance to look at it for a few minutes and decide for yourself. But I won't I won't keep it a secret too long. Um, and so this is the same variety of animal, and it's walking or trotting or moving across the landscape in the same location over and over again. And it's using a different gate each time it does that. And so it tells you something about the habits of the animal to be able to tell something about the gate. You know, if this is a walking animal, okay, so, you know, it's presumably relaxed. It's not concerned about predators necessarily, um, or maybe it's very wary. Um, if it's moving quickly, it's got something you know, like, like a, a quick determined trot, you know, so what does that tell you about the animal? And if it's running hard, what does that say? And it just is interesting to try to piece together, it depends on the animal as to what might be going on, I, you know, um, a prey animal versus a predator animal, for example, but it is interesting to kind of piece or try to piece together what the habits of these animals are. So this is a fox. Um, and you can actually make it, these images are so good that you can actually make out some of those, um, certainly the shape of the paw print in like the far right hand image, the middle, the middlemost image. Um, you can make sense of the shape of the track itself, the individual tracks, and also get a sense that there's, you know, toes in the front and some pads that are, even though it's a small image on your screen, um, et cetera. So, and then the other thing is like, just looking at back at these gates, um, every type of animal is gonna have different gates, just like if you were to compare your horse's gate or your cow's gate or your goat's gate with your cat's gate, you know, a trot in a cat is different than a trot in a giraffe, which is different than a trot in a, in a moose, um, just because the way the animals are built and the way that they move. And um, so when you look at these um, three images of Charlie's, though the outermost image for me, the left-hand image is um, 
yeah, that would be the same for you. So the, the left-hand image is a direct register. So that means that the tracks are on top of each other. And obviously there's no animal that has all four legs lined up the length of its body. So this is an animal that's got four legs that is placing the paws not only in line with each other, but also the, the front and back feet are landing in the same location. Uh, so where the front foot takes off, the back foot is coming in and, and then it moves and um, the animal moves on. So this is, this is a direct register trot um, on, the outer, on the outermost image. And then the center um, image, again, you've got overlapping a little bit. Um, the line is not quite as straight. And so you've got, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's kind of wavers back and forth. And so this is a side trot where the, the, um, the tracks are closer than it looks in the drawing. And so that's a point that you do have to take into consideration sometimes, either the individuality of the animal or perhaps the misrepresentation in charts and diagrams. So sometimes you have to do sort of your own interpretation, but um, some diagrams, you know, will show sort of maybe what's standard, but doesn't mean that every animal moves that way precisely. Um, and then in the uh, right centermost image, you've got a straddle trot. And so um, that's a, you know, so you've got just different modes of, of movement, but they're all uh, pretty similar. They're all in, in the sense that um, they're all not too different in, in pace. What they're different in is how efficient the animal is moving. So, um, you know, the, the animal is, a little bit more, um, a little bit slower and a, li the, the, a little bit more taking its time as you move to the right. So the fastest, you know, the most focused determined method of trotting is the direct register trot. The other ones are more lazy, taking it easy kinds of trots movement. So it was funny, I was going online looking at a few different diagrams. And I was trying to figure out, well, so how do I determine and share with you a little bit about the differences between foxes and dogs and coyotes in particular, um, but cats also can be confusing. So it's um, back to the behavior is usually the key to understanding the differences between these animals. And, you know, usually when you let your dog out of the car, you take it for a walk at Dodge Point or wherever you're going, um, that animal is going to run around and be making loops and circles and sniffing every other tree and round and round and round. Well, you rarely see a coyote or a fox do that kind of work. That, you know, that's that's um, a lot of energy wasting for an animal that's trying to make its living out in the woods and isn't being handed a dish of kibble at the day, start and the end of every day. So. Um, Coyotes and foxes know their territory as a general rule. They make straight lines. They certainly will stop and investigate an animal's den or some particular place, but they're not going to be circumnavigating every tree. They're not going to be, you know, jumping over rocks and logs. And, you know, that's just not, not how they behave. Um, except for if they're playing and they, they certainly do play, but it's much rarer to see that in the prints. So if it's making lots of circles and zooming around, it's, it's very likely a dog. This business about the no center lobe for a dog and the center lobe for a dog. Well, first of all, you have to have an awfully good track to be able to see that. So in a coyote, you've got that center lobe that the arrow is pointing to um, in the middle pad. And um, they do have a big fleshy pad there. Some dogs also will have a bigger, more distinctive looking center pad there than other dogs. So it, that can be quite variable, I would say. Um, and it, it does depend on the breed. It depends on, on, on the individual, maybe it's to some extent too. But if you have really clear set of tracks, this can give you an indication. So if you consistently see a center lobe and a straight line track and it's 
um, a bit bigger than than the fox, especially, then you're going to say coyote. And if you don't see a center lobe and you see some wavering in the tracks, um, then you're probably looking at a dog. Fox is going to be a lot smaller than coyotes, certainly around here, because coyotes here are quite large. And um, uh, of course, dogs have more variability in size. But the fox is again going to be a straight line, just like you saw with the sets that, of Charlie's photographs. And um, they're, they're going to be small. The, a fox is, you know, 15 to 20 pounds at the most. They're a small animal. So you're looking at a, you know, you're looking at a small track when you see these. And um, when you look at the toenail um, or the toes, not the toenail, but the toes of a fox, and you're trying to differentiate it from a dog, a small dog, presumably, you may be able to see if you can look at see how it says the outer toes are behind the inner toes um so that's the 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 lower toes in those images are behind the upper toes and that's not generally the case for a dog again that if it's not a really clear track it's going to be hard to determine that um in a cat you're not going to see the same oval shape their tracks are much rounder, whether it's a bobcat or a, or a domestic cat. And you're not going to see, generally, you're not going to see um, anything in the way of toenails. Their toes, toenails are slimmer and they, they can withdraw them. So um, you're not going to generally see cat, cat toenails of any kind. Feel free to interrupt with questions or observations if you um, got things you'd like to share. That's great. Okay, so um, a little bit more about the patterns of, of the tracks. Well, first of all, we don't have cottontail rabbits here. Um, and so we have snowshoe hares. And so sometimes when you see a bounding set of tracks, um, people do ask me, you know, so is it a hare or is it a squirrel? And how do you know? Well, first of all, you go back to the beginning uh, of the talk and you think, okay, well, so hares have four toes. Um, front and back, and squirrels actually have four toes in the front, and five in the back. So you might be able to tell there if you've got good prints. Um, certainly, if it goes up a tree, you know it is not a hare because they don't climb trees. Um, if you have got, uh, you know, less distinct tracks and it's a bounding animal. Um, one thing is that the hair prints are quite a bit different in size. They're quite a bit bigger, quite a bit more rounded looking. Um, they're quite usually more indistinct because they've got quite a bit of fur on around in between their toes. Um, and so those are all going to tell you that, that this is a hare or a squirrel. And uh, red squirrel, of course, are quite a bit smaller than gray squirrel. And you can look at habitat for that as well. So um, I included this one little picture of the squirrel just because I wanted to make the point about you can tell what direction the animal is moving. Um, so for example, if you look at obviously the, the, the footprints of the squirrel um, in the upper right, you can clearly make out the toes in those. So you know which direction that animal is moving. But in the left hand, hand image, um, you might not be sure which it, it, way it's going. Is it going towards the upper right corner or the lower left corner? And um, of course you think, well, okay, so here we know the, the back feet are big and the front feet are smaller. So that would make me think, well, if it was just sitting there and it left those prints, that it would be headed down towards the lower left corner of that image. But if you look at the way that animal is moving in that photograph, you'll see, um, and hares do the same thing. When they leap, um, they land with their front feet behind their back feet. And so when they take off, um, they push with their back feet and their front feet come up. And you can see in the image above, in the, in the photograph of the prints, this image, um, the animal is actually moving towards the upper right-hand corner of that photograph because 
the back feet are those big prints and the and they've there they've cleared the front feet um, considerably and the front feet are in the lower part of that photograph so this was a neat um, set of tracks that I actually just pulled off the Facebook page um, that uh, it's the uh, Dermascotta outdoors in the Pemulca Dermascotta region and um, and Jody Harris took these pictures and so I asked her for permission to use them this um, I think it was out in Bristol somewhere and she and friends were walking in the snow and they found this big track they found you know right and they put a glove for relative size and took some pictures and then they took some pictures of the whole track set the line of tracks and um they put it up and said you know so what is this is this a deer or a moose because it's got two toes and it looks like that it's got you know pointy area and a less pointy area and it's as big as a glove almost um the no excuse me the snow when this track was made was fairly soft it looks like to me based on the amount of snow that fell into the tracks so it's a little indistinct in the interior part of the track so you can't really tell what went on either that or the snow blew into it in the course of maybe crusting over on the top and then some of the soft snuff stuff blew into the into the tracks themselves um there's a pretty good space in between those tracks um i don't know what it was in length because there was no ruler so i'm not sure how far but you know some some good space and the supposition was that this was one animal um moving across the landscape they've got you know two lines of tracks but when we kind of all talked about it in our facebook way um we you know shooting comments back and forth what is this what is this is this deer or is this moose and it does look like it could be a big deer or um a small moose but the problem is that if it's a big deer um it's a it's it's um it's a weird pattern because deer don't quite move in that pattern. They're not going to have that kind of broad straddle. Um, and it isn't the right pattern. There's no overlap of tracks that anybody noticed or commented on. So it seems strange. And then same with moose. It's the wrong patterning for a moose. Um, and I think, and I'm, I don't have relative size here, but I think that this straddle, you know, in other words, the the breadth of track from uh, right to left or left to right is far too wide, even for a moose. Because when moose walk, while they don't tend or trot, they don't walk with their um, in a single line the way a, a fox does. But the tracks are much closer than this. And when moose walk, if you watch them walk, they dangle their toes and their and the hoof dangles and the whole lower. Um, fetlock, it's what it's called on a horse. Um, it's that, that lower joint and the pastern right before the hoof. It all is like dangling when the animal moves, especially through a foot of snow or 10 inches of snow. So I don't think this is either of those. I think this is a bounding, a bounding hare. Um, I'm not 100% sure because I didn't see them and I don't know the distances, for example. Um, and uh, I, but it's a super interesting mystery uh, out there, and I and I don't think it's a single animal because the track set is wrong, the patterning is wrong. I don't think it's two animals unless it's a hare because there's no overlapping. So I think it's two. I think it's two hares, or maybe one hare that went back and forth, and you can't see the other tracks. I don't know. Sorry.
So back to the squirrel thing, you know, we're just kind of going back and forth squirrels and hares here for a moment. Um, and this is a print that was taken by Betsy Evans and it's, um, it's a gray squirrel and it's, you can, she's just got her thumb in the picture, but you can see that, that in terms of, for comparison to the red squirrel, for example, these prints are bigger. Um, the heel is, is quite long and distinguished in the back foot. The toenails are long and you can see there's four in the front and five in the back. Uh, it's a pretty good image in this regard. So this is nice because these tracks that are put into kind of wet snow and then harden up, that's sometimes you get really clear, clear prints like this. So here's some images. Um, well, first of all, I included on the right side just a uh, shots of um, or drawings of different muscolids, different weasels. It doesn't have a picture of a skunk. A skunk is also, also a muscolid. Um, uh, and all of these animals produce musk. Um, they all use, they're, they're very much um, able to mark their territories, their dens and so forth with musk. And we don't have pine martens right here, but we do have pine martens in northern Maine. They're very much in our, our burial, our, I can't say that word. They live in the trees. Um, and, um, and fishers are big and they live here and also in the north part of Maine as well. Um, mink are quite a bit smaller, short tail, long tail weasels even, even smaller, especially in terms of the prints that they make. So those um, short and long tail weasels are the ones that turn white in the wintertime. So if you do get to see them, they're beautiful little animals and uh, their coat does change from season to season. So this is a print I took, a, or I still say print, but it was just a photograph taken with a digital camera, <laughs> not a print um, of a uh, animal that moved across the trail actually on the Riverlink Trail and um, that's my glove sort of there by the prints. This is an animal and it is a little indistinct, certainly in the photograph, but you can, when in person, I could certainly see actually, although it was somewhat indistinct because the tracks were overlapping in many places, but there were certainly five toes front and back. So I knew that this was a, this was some type of weasel. Much too big to be short, long tail weasel, too big to be a mink. Um, this animal did move down to the water the way mink do. Mink love to be in the water also and moved down across the stream, but it didn't dive into the stream as far as I could tell. It seemed to, it actually, you could tell where it leapt over the stream and kept going um, up a bank and through the woods. So this is a fisher and I was, I was basing that um, primarily on size and behavior, but also on the toe prints as well. Um, so it was, it was trotting intermittently, bounding occasionally, um, and that also is consistent with Fisher. They, they vary their mode of transportation quite a lot. I'm just getting into a few miscellaneous tracks before I kind of open it up. I wanted to give people time to chit, chat about what they've been seeing. But um, this is a, you know, a lot of times when we see birds, um, we, we identify them because they, they well, they have four toes and um, they tend to often, many of them hop. Some of them walk one foot and then another, like if, if you're thinking about a crow. And um, this animal obviously was not hopping. It was walking one foot, not only one foot after another, but one foot in line with another. And so this is a ruffed grouse. This was um, in Walpole Woods a few weeks ago. And they, make these cute little tracks running back and forth across the trail. And of course, habitat is a, a big identifier. Um, there actually were some walking bird tracks nearby that were not a ruffed grouse, but um, this ruffed grouse was definitely seeking the underbrush of some firs and spruces. And it was a little bit upland. That's also consistent with ruffed grouse. There are lots of other signs that we don't really have time to cover every single one for every, every single species of animal that's out there. But, um, uh, you know, just a, just a little bit of a, 
of a list, um, things that you might come across, everything from dropped antlers to bedding sites, um, dens and so forth, all kinds of things. And uh, in this amount of time, of course, we can't go through all of them, but I hopefully some of you can share some of the things that you've been seeing in a few minutes. I did wanna um, show this image by Ruth Ferry. She um, shared this with us during a recent fireside chat. So she found this before the snow covered and um, this is a birch log that's been taken apart by an animal. And we discussed at length, you know, so is this a woodpecker doing this on the ground? That seems a little unusual. Um, or is this a bear looking for ants in dead wood or some other grubs and so forth? Um, and uh, it, 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 I'm quite convinced now, I actually had to ask a bear specialist person I know to check on this, but bears will take apart dead wood sometimes and they'll certainly scratch on living trees, both for territorial purposes and um, because they'll, they'll actually um, uh, scratch on trees for, um, eat for, you know, looking for, for food. Um, but this is a case where a woodpecker has just feasted by taking um, the bark or the tree and throwing it all over the place. And a bear wouldn't necessarily throw it all over the place this way. It's sort of interesting. A bear, if a bear was doing this, it probably would just take apart the log and the pieces of the wood would just be next to the log. And if you watch the way the birds do it, for whatever reason, they fling it all over the place. And I've seen them do this and probably a number of you have as well. So they'll be taking apart a log and they fling the little bits um, and they're finding insects in there. And so um, it was just sort of an interesting conversation we had that wanted to point that out. Well, the, um, bears, another really interesting sign you can look for that I've only seen a couple of times, but bears do make nests in trees where they'll pile up young branches and um, eat them over time and use the bedding, use the branches as bedding as well. <clears throat> they like to do this in, in beech groves. So that's um, an inter interesting thing to learn about and, and look for. So yeah, so these are some of the uh, guides that I like to use and um, the center one, uh, I guess I should have remembered Richard Smith but at any rate, it's not a very unusual name, but Richard Smith's guide is pretty good. Um, but uh, the Peterson guide is also very helpful. So there, there are a lot of them out there. And I think, you know, some of it's just sort of what you like to use. And you don't have to have one to the, all of North America either, certainly. If you want to narrow it down somewhat to just Maine, that, that can be helpful, certainly. And kind of a note to end on, um, here's three images taken by Marcia Kimpton. I think she's with us today that I really don't know what they are. And um, we, we talked about all kinds of things. And this is um, down, the, the, the lowermost image is actually um, right next to the icy water there. And she's got her hand in the centermost image to kind of give you a sense of size. So it's a pretty big sized animal and it's got a, got a triangle shape to it certainly in that one. And the toes were sort of indistinguishable even in some other images she had. Um, and so it was just super hard for me to figure out. I didn't see any pairing of tracks. So, you know, pairing of tracks would usually means like a beaver or something like that. The back foot of a beaver could be almost as large as your hand, but um, so I just, I encourage you to go out there and enjoy the mysterious things that you can't always identify as well as the ones that you can. So, so please go ahead. Um, Angela's gonna give us questions and, and folks should unmute themselves maybe if they want to um, just speak up uh, at some point. But Angela, go ahead, did you have? Yes. So. On the animal guides, um, Eve wants to let people know that they love the Animal Tracks of New England, which is a lone pine field guide. Um, and then we had a question about ruffed grouse, if you could describe what a ruffed grouse is. Oh, sure. 
and I can actually maybe even do better than that and um, it, and give you an image here if I can if I can do this three things simultaneously. Um, so ruffed grouse uh, is a small bird and um, they like to live in those upland environments. And let me find here, rough grouse. Um, they look a little bit like a chicken, I suppose. Let's see. And let me see if I can share my screen back again, just to give you the image. Oops. Let's see. Um, can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. There he is, she, there, a rough grouse. Um, partridge is another common name around here for rough grouse. And they eat seeds that they find underneath those hemlocks and, and firs and so forth. Um, definitely a seed eating bird. And they're the bird that if you're walking through underbrush or low hanging branches of evergreens, they'll all of a sudden, they'll wait and wait and wait and wait. And they sit there hoping you're not gonna see them. But then at the last second, when they're convinced that you might've seen them, they bolt you know, low in the, under the branches and they fly up and um, surprise you as you, you know, cause they, they, they can make quite a racket. And it, I have, a, I used to ride quite a lot more than I do now, but my horse is always used to shy at the location where the rough grouse would look fly out, even though the rough grouse were not flying out because they were convinced that the rough grouse were going to fly out under their noses. Um, but anyway, so that's a rough grouse. Good questions. There's yes. A yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Anna. <laughs> There's an, another animal that I see out in the woods, tracks of this animal all the time, uh, especially over in the Bremen Town Forest. And that's the turkey. And, you know, it looks like a gigantic tri uh, chicken mark on it. But what's even more interesting is the way that it just churns up the leaves. It looks as though somebody has maybe gone through there with a the rototiller. <laughs> and, and that, those are all over Maine right now. Yeah, good, that's a really a good, good point. To... Yeah, they're everywhere. And like you say, like say, even if you don't see the actual footprint, but you see that the rototilling of the bird underneath the underneath the canopy, you know, in the forest. It's that's a really good one that I didn't include. Good point. Good. Uh, yes, Bill. Yeah, I have to tell you a story because I was with Jim Grenier last year and we happened to be walking and he go, look at that. Those are bobcat, bobcat tracks. And because of the hair on the paw, very distinctive print that he put in the ground. And I, so I, I paid attention. I knew what the bobcat print was now, maybe. And the next day I walked, I monitored a property at the Cayman's property, Samuel and Louise, and as I'm walking around the property, I'm looking down, I go, holy mackerel, that's a bobcat because of the hair imprint on the snow of the paw. And I walked around the house and Louise was there and I said, you won't believe this, but I just saw a bobcat tracks all around your property. Oh, Samuel and I just saw him yesterday. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was a fun story and I'm not a tracker. So that was, that was, uh, that was a wonderful thing to see. Yeah, definitely. Especially since I happen to know they have big cats. I mean, pet <laughs> cats. And you, but you knew the difference. So that's, that's great. So yeah, was, yeah the, <laughs> the bobcats are, are, I think I'm hearing more stories of people um, seeing them and seeing their prints. And so, I mean, at least anecdotally, I would say that's possible that there are more of them in this immediate vicinity than there have been uh, recently. Um, and again, I mean, the domestic cat versus the bobcat can be sometimes hard to tell. And one way is the behavior, you know? So if it's acting like a wild animal versus acting like a domesticated animal, um, that's a big part of it. Cats also often have um, multiple extra toes. And so sometimes if you do get clear prints, that's another way, but you're right that that hair and the indistinctive aspect of the, or indistinct aspect of the toes of those tracks, Bill, is definitely a telltale 
So nice. Good. I'll tell you one other story because I had tracks outside my bedroom window and I said, this has got to be a porcupine because it's these weird double track following things. And your picture today finally solved my problem. I, it was a porcupine. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So fun. Yeah, porcupines are, you know, I don't know. They're pretty, pretty special animals. I, one time I was, when I was a kid, I went up to a porcupine and I kind of got down on its level. It was on the ground eating apples and the porcupine took its paws and went like this over its eyes and endeared me to porcupines forever because, you know, it was like, it was like, it was like, if I don't see you, you're not there kind of thing. Um, so that's so sweet. Good. Any other stories or questions, photographs you want to share as we wrap it up? Oh, Anna one, has one more. One more thing. I'm, I'm still intrigued by that print that you can't identify. I know. And I'm wondering, I have, I have a big dog, a poodle, who has to wear booties when he goes out <laughs> in the snow because he collects these massive ice balls. And I'm wondering if that's one of those dogs that has a sock in which you can see the print of long claws coming out the top. I don't know, but also as a heads up that if you've got people around running their dogs like me, you're going to see some weird prints out there. <laughs> that's, that's a good cautionary tale and good point. <laughs> oh, yeah, I might have to go over to the Marsha's footprint spot and see if I can see any other signs of wildlife over there. Yeah, that, that is a mystery. That really is. It, it is. It is. And, and photographs make it a little extra challenging. So, you know, what you might see in person, you're getting much more of a full picture of habitat, behavior, all the other surrounding tracks, you know, the environment, how hard the snow is, how soft the snow is. You get so much by being out in the field that you can't easily transfer into, into a photograph. So um, kudos to everybody who gave it a try. All right. I'll, uh, Lensa, is that correct pronunciation? Is there a question or a comment? Go ahead. What do bear tracks look like? Oh, that's another good one that we didn't talk about today. So bear tracks look like, sometimes they look like almost like a human footprint. Uh, the back feet do. Uh, furrier and rounder, the toe pads and so forth are rounder at the back foot. And the front foot, really, you only see the front part of the paw and the toes in the print. You don't always see anything on the heel of the, of the front part of the, hook, of the foot. And interestingly, um, people are seeing more bear prints around, even at this time of year, than I, people would either expect or that I think I've heard about in the past. I don't know whether this is a climatic change or a bear change. I'm not sure which it is. Uh, bears always have come out of their dens some of the time. They're not strict, strict hibernators. They also give birth during the winter, the females do. So um, even though they certainly hibernate and you wouldn't expect to see their tracks at this time of year, there, there are some certainly some individuals who are coming out of hibernation and going back into, um, and it's not true hibernation at that point, it's sort of a, a temporary torpor and then uh, going ahead and, and staying in their dens for a period of time and coming back out, uh, especially young ones apparently do this more. So does that answer your question? That was a good one. Excellent. Great. Well, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Feel free to email me any mystery, mysterious tracks. Um, it's always fun to see them. And it was absolutely my pleasure to join you. So I hope um, everybody gets out and finds some great tracks to enjoy outside. It's, it's always fun, so. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.